All right, let's get started. Uh, you folks may need to get back to work, uh, you know, on a, on a rigid time scale. So um, let's not wait around anymore. So uh, I'm Jim Detweiler, your instructor. I think this is the first time we've uh, held one of these live. So um, I just wanted to go over some of the, uh, some points in lesson two that I think are especially uh, important and could benefit from, you know, seeing me walk through uh, something. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of slides, talking through some slides, but before I do that, I wanted to do uh, something uh, a little more uh, perhaps interesting, uh, interactive. Um, at any point in this uh, session, please feel free to speak up. I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to speak up at, at times, uh, ask for volunteers with answers to questions, uh, but f please don't hesitate to uh, speak up if you uh, want to interrupt me. Uh, don't understand something that we, we talk about. So uh, one of the things that um, is important to understand in working with Python is how to deal with strings, uh, how to get subsets of strings, uh, how to use some of the functions that are available when working with strings. And so I just want to work here in the uh, interactive window in Python Win to uh, you know, demonstrate some of this string manipulation. Uh, so I'm gonna create a new variable called x, and I'm going to stick a string in it, assign a string to it, uh, and you know, something fairly simple. If I wanted to uh, get a specific character out of that larger string, I can inside uh, square brackets after the string uh, plug in a single digit, as I just did there, or as we'll see, uh, I can uh, plug in uh, a digit followed by a colon followed by another digit to get a full uh, substring. So, you know, one of the things to uh, get used to or keep in mind when dealing with strings is that they are indexed starting with zero as the first character. And so if I do print X zero in square brackets, I'll get back the first character, in this case, uh, a capital P. And you know, as you would expect, then if I did this, I'll get the second character. Now, if I do something like this, anybody know what I'll be, uh, what I should expect to see? And you can speak up or you can uh, type it into the chat box. I think you would, so this is Joe, I think you would get the, from N to you, that character number six. So looking, reading across that span, that range. Yeah, so it, you would start at character three, which is uh, the second N actually in pen. Now the, the kind of tricky part about this is that, you know, lots of programming languages provide the means to do this sort of thing and they operate in different ways. In some languages, uh, you might expect to start at character three and then give me the next six, next six characters. Uh, that's not how Python string slicing works. Um, and you also might expect, or you might also expect to start at character three and go up to character six. And that's also not really how, how Python works. Uh, how it works is actually it's going to start at character three and go up to but not include character six. Uh, so in other words, it'll give me characters three, four, and five. Um, so that's, that's what we get there, n space and then capital S state. So that's, that's something to get used to. Um, how about this? Anyone know? Uh, wouldn't that just give you from character six all the way through to the end, or eight? Uh, well, it'll it'll start a character, um, the sixth character, which is at position seven, mm -hmm. um, right. and then give you the rest of the string by, by leaving off uh, a second digit. By leaving off that second digit, you're saying that you want everything beyond character seven. Um, so that'll give us ATE. 
Okay, good. Um, now, how about this one? I guess I, I would go from last, so the third character in from the right and then to the beginning. Yeah, I, I think I think you're right there. And then Matt also says in the chat box uh, that it'll, it'll uh, spit out pen. And that's right. It's going to, um, by leaving off the uh, first digit, you're saying that you want to start at the beginning of the and the second digit after the digit after the colon says, uh, give me everything up to, but not including uh, character four. So character four would be the space, uh, the character at position four. So, um, so we get 10 for that one. All right. How about uh, X negative two? as pen space STA. Any other guesses? It's going to give me the third from the end or first from the end. Yeah, so it's going to uh, start from the end of the string. And when you supply just a single digit, you're going to get back just a single character. And well, if you supply a single digit without the colon, I should say, uh, as we did here, then you're just going to get back one character. So we're going to get uh, starting from the end of the string, two characters from the end, which is the T, uh, the last T in the state. All right, and. So does that mean when you're counting from the end, it doesn't have the zero index? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I, I guess that's I guess that's how you would say that is that you don't start at zero if you're counting from the end, right? And then how about this one? Yeah, Matt is <laughs> you're right now, Matt. Uh, this one gives you uh, n space st. This one says, uh, because the colon's involved and there, there's nothing before the colon, you're saying you want to start at the beginning of the string and go until two characters from the end. So, um, yeah, the, this can get a little tricky to uh, remember the rules on how these work, but, um, and, and honestly, I don't, <laughs> when I'm writing Python scripts, I don't really remember all the rules and I have to look them up, uh, but that's okay. That's that's one, one of the, uh, things that distinguishes good uh, programmers is that they're able to look up in the documentation or they're able to look up on question and answer forums online, the answers to uh, the questions that they run into. Um, so strings have a number of methods. Strings are treated as objects in Python and objects have properties and methods. Methods being actions that the object is capable of performing, knows how to perform. And uh, one of the methods that strings have uh, is the index method. And index method, and if you type in a string dot, you'll get a list of its properties and methods. The index method allows you to find the position of a smaller string within a larger string. In this case, if I wanted to find the position of the space in the X variable, I could uh, plug in a space uh, just like I did, and it'll return to me uh, four. Uh, the space is found at position four within the string. So that, that's something that can come in handy uh, as a programmer. Uh, another one of these methods is split. 
which can be used as the name implies to split a larger string into smaller strings, smaller pieces. And you know, this is something that uh, could be used if you had a uh, comma delimited uh, string. You could break that up into pieces or as I'm doing here, uh, basing it on spaces found in the string. And now this method is gonna return to me a list of the smaller strings that are created by splitting the larger one. And so I'm gonna to wanna to do something with that list. And so what I'm doing here is storing that list in a variable called pieces. And then I could do work with those items in the list. And so here I'm just gonna print the item at position zero in the list, which will give me 10. And then as you'd expect, printing pieces at position one will give me state. Another method for strings is the ends with. So if I did this, the, the ends with method uh, returns a Boolean, a true or false value, uh, depending on whether the string that you uh, supply to it um, is, is found at the end of the string in the variable that you're uh, working on. So um, here the X variable holds Penn State, and yes, that ends in ATD, so I would expect to get back true. This, then as I'd expect, uh, I get false. Okay, so that's that's another one of those methods that can be useful. And then the last one I'll, I'll go over is uh, a method called replace. This takes two arguments, the string that I want to replace. help box, the old string, and a new string. And then optionally, I could also uh, supply a count. In other words, how many of the substrings do I want to replace? I'm going to leave that off, replace all occurrences of pen with Pennsylvania. That leaves the X variable as is, but the Y variable now holds in which pen has been changed to Pennsylvania. Okay, so th these are just some of the methods that are available. Uh, we went over how to get a substring out of a larger string as well. So um, hopefully this will help you on the project two assignment. Uh, you expect us to do some string uh, manipulation in that assignment. So hopefully that'll So please, you know, definitely practice and the interactive window is a good place to do that sort of practicing. Any questions about manipulating strings? Okay. So now I wanted to uh, go through some slides and I've got some review questions talking about uh, things that you should remember from lesson one. Okay, sorry, uh, are you folks able to see my uh, slide that says review? Or are we're, you still seeing? We still were, seeing but now it's down low. Yeah, okay. I had it up for a second. Um, let me try again.
Okay, you should see it now. Um, so when you put a print statement in a Python script, where does that output go? Anybody know? Where were we just working in the Python? In the interactive window. The interactive window, right. Sorry, I'm having all kinds of trouble with, uh, <laughs> with PowerPoint here. All right, true or false, uh, variables X lowercase and X uppercase can be used interchangeably in a Python script. No, false. That says false, Jill says false. Yeah, right, um, that's correct. Uh, Python is an example of a case sensitive language. So those are two separate variables. That's not always the case in other languages, but uh, it is Python. True or false, Python was developed as a scripting language for ArcGIS. Matt says false, Jill says false, right. Um, yeah, if you learn nothing else from this class, hopefully you'll uh, remember this. Uh, Python was developed completely independently of Esri of ArcGIS. Uh, and uh, simply chosen by Esri as a, as a good uh, language to uh, use for geoprocessing scripting. Okay, uh, what, what's the result of this script? Six. Six, right. But what about this version? Y and X are stored as strings. Henry says three, three, and he's right. Um, in this case, because X and Y are strings, when you do X plus Y, the plus operator uh, takes on a different, um, it operates differently. When you put it between two strings, you're concatenating or merging the strings together. Uh, whereas when you put it between two numbers, you're saying that you want to add the strings together. So that's something that's important to uh, understand about programming in Python. All right, how do you add a comment to a Python script? Anyone remember? Yeah, uh, pound sign. Yeah, so you, uh, you stick the pound sign in your uh, your line of code somewhere. Now, an actual line of code. And uh, the idea is that everything to the right of the pound sign is going to be ignored when your code is executed, okay? So, and you may have scripts where you do both, where you have it at the beginning of the statement or at the end of certain lines. Um, and both ways uh, is fine. What keywords are used to specify uh, what part of the script the interpreter should attempt to execute and which part should be executed if an error occurs? I know what I'm talking about there. Is that the try accept? Right, right. Yep. You would uh, use try and then indent that you would like to try um, and then later on after you've got all your code you would have uh, an accept at the same indentation level as the try and then indented underneath that you'll have the code that you would like to execute in the event that your your try code fails it generates an error and so as the lesson talks about uh, using try and accept is a good, good way to uh, make sure that your script fails gracefully. In other words, it doesn't show the user an ugly, um, user unfriendly error message. Now, when you're developing the code yourself, you may want to avoid using try and accept. 
you may want to see the ugly error message because the ugly error message may point you to where the problem is in your code. But then when you've got it working and you, you think it's, it's in good shape, then you should, and, and you're ready to expose it to users, then having try and accept is, is a really good idea. Okay, true or false, the code within a try block and an accept block must be indented for spaces. Henry says true, Joe says true. Yeah, that's true. Um, okay. Skip over that. Um, So let, let's talk a little bit about lists. I, I think some of what is uh, in the slides that I have here was already talked about in the first video session, the one that I gave you an old recording. Um, so I won't, I won't spend a whole lot of time on this, but a list is a set of related items that you want to treat as a single unit in your code. Uh, it could be numbers, it could be strings, objects, or it could be a mixture of those. And the items are going to be separated by commas and enclosed in brackets. An example here would be we have a layers variable and we're assigning to that variable uh, this list of strings, roads, cities, and counties. And I can retrieve an item from the list using its index position. And like we saw with strings, the characters within strings, the indexing is zero based. So if I do using that Layers variable from the previous uh, bullet point. If I do la print layers and then two in square brackets, that's going to return to me counties. Um, actually, the third item in the list. And uh, one of the things we can do with lists that's uh, useful is we could sort them using uh, the list objects sort method. So using that same layers list, I could do layers.sort. And if I wanted it in descending order, instead of ascending, I could use the reverse method as shown. Now, uh, oftentimes it's, uh, as developers, we need to modify lists on the fly. So here I've got two list variables, list one and list two. And one of the things that I can do is I can merge them together. Uh, and here again, we're using the plus operator. And again, it's, it's doing something different because of the different context that it's being used in. When the plus operator is used in between two lists, then it merges those two lists together. And so I'm taking that merged list and sticking it, sticking it in a third variable, this one called list three. And you can see that it, it puts together the two lists. Or if I wanna add an item, to the end of a list, I can use a method called append. So here I've got that, that same layers list that I had a couple of slides ago. And I can add a new layer called streams to the end of that list using the append method. There. Or if I want to stick an item into the list, not at the end, but at some other position, I can use the insert method. And as you see here, it's uh, list variable dot insert. And then there's two arguments that I have to supply. Uh, before I supply the actual item that I want to put into the list, I have to supply the position that I want to put it in. And so if I say uh, a position of one, then it's going to stick it, make it the new item at position one in the list. So it replaces, it takes counties and roads and shifts them and plugs in streams into position one. Okay, now one of the things that you can do with a list is you can get its length. And you do that using the len function built into Python. So here I've got a, a list stored in a, in a variable called children. So I can say len parentheses children to get back the length of So let me ask you a question. How would I output the last item in a list? Let's assume that I, I don't know the length of the list. Okay. 
So Jill says I could say print children and then in square brackets, negative one. And yeah, I think that's, I think that's true. I was looking for something that involved the len function, but I think you're right about that. That's another way. Yeah, so what I was looking for involving len would be something like this, where I could use the len function So Henry has a had had a uh, print children and then lend children in, inside the square brackets. The only trouble with that is lend children in this case is going to return four, which is going to be one uh, one more than the last item. So what you actually have to do is take that lend and subtract one, which I I show here. But you know, as Jill said, an easier way is to using the indexing. I could supply a negative number instead of a positive number to start from the end of the list. Okay, so uh, another, another uh, programming construct that's really important to work with in any language really is uh, the loop. And loops are used to repeat uh, certain lines of code. There's two types in Python, the for loop, which is used to iterate through a list or to, to the items in a list. And then the other is a while loop. And we use while loops to loop until some condition is met. So we'll start with for loops. Uh, as I said, a for loop in Python is used to iterate through a list. And that list could be defined before the for statement. And here's an example of that. So I've got this uh, same children list from the previous slide. And I can set up a loop like you see there. The key elements of this uh, are that you start with the word for, and we'll skip ahead. You've got the word in. After in is gonna be your list. In this case, I'm pulling the list out of a variable. In between for and in is gonna be a variable that I come up with, whose name I come up with, right there, uh, that I would like to store an individual item from that list um, on each pass through the loop. So as the code inside the loop gets executed on each pass through there, uh, child here in this case is going to take on a different value. So the first iteration through the loop, it will take on the first value in the list, in this case, Stan, Print it out, goes back to the top of the loop, goes and gets the next item in the list. Kyle prints that out, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Once it's reached the end of the list and it goes back to the top again, it sees that there is no more items in the list, and it would jump down to the next line after the loop, which we're not seeing here in this in this short little example. Now we can also generate a list within the for statement using the range function. And so here's an example of that. And this is the kind of loop that you may be familiar with from other programming. And the way the range function works is it actually returns a list of numbers. And so this returns a list starting with one and going up to 10. So this is kind of similar to uh, the way we were seeing uh, getting substrings, slicing a string, where it gives you up to but not including uh, the second number. So as you see here, it would print one, two, three, all the way down to 10. A little bit more about the range method. Typically, you're going to supply two arguments, like I showed in the previous slide. And this is reiterating that you start at one and you stop just before getting to 11 in this case. But you can also use it with one argument. So if I just supplied 11, it would assume a starting point of zero. So my list would be 
a little bit different than the previous example. It would start with zero instead of one. Or I can supply three arguments. And so here's an example that you might use in a situation where you're dealing with census data, US census data, where you've got data for every, uh, every 10 years, 1980, 1990, 2000, etc. So this says to start with 1980 and to go up to but not including 2030 and instead of going, instead of incrementing by one on each pass through loop, increment by 10. In other words, the step value is 10. So that would produce this list that you see here. So that's, that's for loops. While loops, as we said, the, the code is executed until some conditions met. So here's an example of that. I'm gonna set this variable n equal to zero, initialize it to zero, and then I say while n is less than 10, do something, in this case just print. And then an important thing here is that n is, is changing, it's, it's being changed Loop. Now this syntax here might look a little odd to you if you haven't uh, programmed in Python or other languages use the same syntax. Uh, basically it says take whatever n was before and add one to it and stick that back into the n variable. So if n was zero, n would become one. It would go back to the, the loop condition statement. It would see yes, n is still less than 10. So I will do the code inside again. And that would continue until n got up to 10. And at that point, n would no longer be less than 10. And it would uh, then jump out of the loop and go down to the first line after the loop. Now, one of the things that uh, you can do with loops that's, uh, that can be really useful is you can nest them. Here's an example of that. So let's say I've got data for three different states, and I've got the same layers uh, in each of those states. I've got cities in Pennsylvania, cities in New York, cities in, in New Jersey, likewise I've got towns and roads. And let's say I want to do something, some sort of processing on all of those layers. Well, I could have a loop that iterates through all of the items in my layers list, and then I could immediately follow that up with a, a nested loop inside that iterates through all the states in my states list. And you know, notice here, I, I don't think I mentioned it, but one of the naming conventions that's uh, smart to follow is to, if you've got a set of items in a list, name that variable something plural. And then when you have a loop where you're iterating through those items, assign, the, uh, assign a name to the iterator variable, as it's sometimes called, a singular version of that same word. Okay, so layer in layers, state in states. And that just makes the code, um, you know, it makes it easier to interpret than if you said X in layers or something like that. So um, inside the uh, these nested uh, loops, what I'm doing is I'm saying, uh, okay, I want to store in this variable uh, layer, whatever layer happens to be, I want to concatenate that with an underscore followed by state. So on the first pass through these loops, uh, layer will be cities. State will start out as PA. So I, I would end up with X being cities underscore PA. And then I have this print statement that prints out processing layer cities underscore PA. It would go back to the top of the states loop, state would become NY. So then X would be cities underscore NY, would print that out. Then it would be cities underscore NJ. It would get, go back to the top of the loop. It would see that there's no more states in the states list. So that would take it back to the top of the layers list. At that point, layer would become counties then it would start up the states loop again. State would be, would start out as PA. 
So I'd have counties underscore PA, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so that's, that's an efficient way to uh, deal with a situation like that. And so this is the output that I would expect. I would get all the cities, then all the counties, and then all the roads. Here's another example, um, kind of returning to the idea of having census data. Let's say I've got uh, census, census data at different geographies, uh, at the county level, at the tracts level, at the block group level. So I could have those different geographic levels stored in a list. Then I could iterate through that list. And then I could uh, use the range function, as we saw, to generate a list of years. 1990, 2000, 2010. And, uh, you know, I could have a nested loop similar to the previous slide. And, uh, you know, one thing that's a little bit different than the previous slide, aside from the range, use of the range function, um, I've got this little bit going on here. Anybody want to explain what's going on here with the STR year negative two? Why didn't I just have YR as the thing that I'm concatenating with? Uh, YR is it's a number, so you have to specify that it's a string. Good, yeah, exactly. So yeah, the range function uh, returns a list of numbers. And if I want to uh, merge that number, concatenate that number with other text, I need it to be in the form of a string. And so I use the string function to cast that number or convert that number into a, uh, into a string. And it just does that on the fly. It doesn't change what's held in the year variable. Uh, but then also the other thing that's going on here is I'm using that uh, substring notation. My uh, layer is actually uh, named using a convention like counties underscore 90 or counties underscore 00. The year as a string. Uh, give me everything everything beyond that. So it would give me 90 or 00, zero or 10. Okay. All right, now um, ArcPy has uh, a lot of functions that return lists and we can use a for loop to iterate through those, those list items. So here's an example of that. Let's say I've got a shape file called US boundaries. I can store the path to that shape file in a variable. And then I can use a, use a method called list fields, access through the ArcPy module, uh, and then specify the feature class that I, I want to list the fields in. That returns to me a list. And here I'm storing that list in a variable. And then as we've seen, I can have a for loop that goes through that list. Again, I'm doing that plural singular naming. And then, so, so the field, e each field uh, returned by the list fields method is an object that has properties and methods. And one of the properties is its name. Another property is its type. You know, whether it stores geometry or uh, double precision numbers or strings. So, you know, in this little example here, I'm simply uh, printing the name of the field concatenated with a dash, concatenated with the type of field. I'm going to skip over. Online. So I'll just ask at this point, did anybody have any trouble or any questions about these exercises? Okay. 
So um, here's an example where we loop and concatenate uh, in a geoprocessing context. So start out importing ArcPy. I'm defining a, a variable called in folder that stores the path to some shapefiles. And then I'm defining a separate folder that I'm going to store some results in. Really what this uh, example does is it clips uh, all of the shapefiles in my input folder using a uh, shapefile that stores the boundary of the state of Nebraska. Okay, so it's, it's, let's say it's a bunch of national level data, different shapefiles, and I want to clip them to the state of Nebraska's boundary and stick them in a separate folder. So to do this, I'm making use of a method called list feature classes. And the list feature classes method, very importantly, it's going to list the feature classes in a particular place. Instead of telling it a folder, supplying a folder as an argument to the method in parentheses, what it does instead is it lists the feature classes in whatever the current workspace is. And so an important part of using list feature classes is to first set the workspace. And so you get to the workspace property through the ENV or environment module. So that's what this line's doing here. arcpy.env.workspace equals in folder, um, sets the workspace, and then I can list the feature classes in that workspace. And then as we've seen, we can loop through the items in that list uh, using a for loop. And basically what I do here is uh, I get the name of the feature class and I uh, merge that together with the results folder where I want to put the output, store that concatenation in a variable called output path. And then I make use of the clip tool in the analysis uh, toolbox. It wants to know the name of the input feature class, what feature to use um, to do the clipping, and what you want to call the output. So that's, uh, that's a, a relatively simple example, putting together uh, both string concatenation and looping, uh, two of the topics we've talked about. I've already talked about uh, string manipulation at the very beginning, so I'll just uh, do that. Um, I think we talked about casting variables in, in the first uh, lesson. So I'll jump through that. Now, uh, tuples. Uh, also be pronounced tuples, I believe. Uh, but tuples are uh, another data structure in Python, very similar to lists. Uh, the syntax is going to be the same as, as a list, except I'm going to replace the square bracket with uh, a set of parentheses. Now, the difference between tuples and lists are that tuples are immutable, which is just a uh, $10 word for meaning that you can't change the items list. So in other words, um, here's an example of a list, which I know, I know it's a list because of the use of the square brackets. I can change the item at position two with a, a different string, as we see there. If I try to do the same thing with a tuple, and this is a tuple because I'm using parentheses instead of square brackets. If I try that, I'll get an error telling me that uh, this tuple object does not support item assign, which is kind of a really formal way of saying that you can't change items in a tuple. Okay, so um, if you have a situation where you have a set of items that you would like to do something with in your, in your program, it might make that set of items in any way. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about dictionaries. Uh, we'll get to dictionaries later, later in the class. And uh, I think we already talked about if, if, elif, else, uh, conditional statements. Lesson one. And 
comparison operators, I think we're already, already discussed. What I really wanted to talk about was uh, and, and demonstrate was debugging. So here we've got a little tiny little script where I'm defining a variable called a uh, year and I'm assigning it a value of 2010. I've got a while loop that says while year is greater than 1970, you know, do some print statement. And then I say, There is a problem with the script. <laughs> Does anybody see it? The condition associated with the while loop, will it ever be met? I should say, Will it ever be false? So, in 70, 1970, it start out as, starts out as 2010, and on each pass through the loop, it's having uh, 10 added to it. So it'll become 2020, 2030. Um, so that's an example of an infinite loop. Maybe some of you have run into one of these before, either in Python or, or some other language. All right, the, the debugging in Python win, there is a uh, toolbar called the debugging toolbar. And the reason that I'm talking through this uh, is that I think it's really important that you folks get in the habit uh, you know, unless you can write programs that uh, work right from the start without any kind of uh, fixing, you're going to need to debug your code. And going through it one line at a time, you know, if you just hit the run button, uh, try to run the whole thing all at once, you, you know, you'll get an error message which may or may not point you to the right, to, to the offending line and to, to the problem line. Whereas if you step through it one line at a time, you really will be able to see what line causes a crash in your code. And then you can focus on that line uh, and try to fix it. The other thing you can do in a, in a debugging environment is you can set breakpoints. This is helpful. Uh, let's say you've got, you know, a thousand line script. and You know that the first 900 lines are pretty good. Well, you're not going to want to step through uh, 900 lines of codes to get to the place where you know the problem is. And that's where setting a breakpoint towards the end of the script can be helpful. You can run up to the breakpoint and then start stepping. Another thing you can do in, in debugging environments is you can watch variables. In other words, you can um, see what the value held in a variable is and, and watch how it changes as you, as you uh, iterate through your script. Uh, there is, uh, as we'll see in a second when I get into a demo, there is a step over button, which I typically use to step through my code. Um, and instead of clicking on that button on the GUI, uh, it has a shortcut key, which is the F10 key. So um, that, that's what I use. All right, so let's, let's uh, do a little demo. And this is going to be the last thing that I, I do in the, the live session. And at that point, when I, when I, finish, when I am finished, I'll uh, open up the question. So um, here I've got a, uh, a little script. And first, let me turn off the debugging toolbar because it's not on by default. 
This is what you see when you, when you run Python Win for the first time after installing it. So you have to go to the toolbars menu, the view menu, then toolbars to turn it on. And these are the step buttons. And I'll just start with the first one. And when I click on it, I'm gonna turn this off for now. When I click on it, you'll notice that uh, a couple things. The uh, first, you'll see a yellow triangle pointing at uh, the first line in the script. And that yellow triangle tells me that I'm in, in debugging mode. I'm, I'm executing the script, but it's paused waiting for me to, to do something. You'll also see up in the title bar, instead of just saying Python win, it now says Python win dash break. Um, which is just telling me again that it's paused waiting. I'm gonna hit step again, and you'll notice that it opens up another window. And this is actually um, a initialization script associated with ArcPy. You can see the, the copyright Esri. And um, if, I would, if I were going to continue hitting step, I would be stepping through Esri's, uh, you know, basically their ArcPy code. And I don't really want to do that. What I'm interested in, in is stepping through my code. And so I'm going to get out of here. Anytime you're in debugging mode and you want to stop executing the, the code, you can click on this close button. And I'm going to close this Esri module that I'm not really interested in. So that's, that's one of the step buttons. It's going to step through all of the code that is gonna be executed as part of your script. So you're executing not just the code that you write in your script file, but if you're calling on other modules, as we are here, importing the ArcPy module, that, that means executing other module code too. So I, that's why I don't like the step button in most cases. There's also a step out, um, which enables you, I think, if I remember correctly, if you're in a situation like I was just in, where I was in the, inside the uh, Esri module that I didn't care about, I could get out of it using the step out button, I think. Um, but the, the one that I use is this step over. And so I'll click on it, and then again. And the first time you import ArcPy, as you may have noticed, it takes a while. Uh, and that's because ArcPy is a fairly large module, and it takes, it takes a few seconds to uh, load it into memory. Then if you run the script again, it's very quick because ArcPy is already loaded into memory. Um, but eventually, as you see there, uh, it, the yellow triangle jumps down to the next line, telling me that that's the next line that it's about to execute if I continue. And so you'll notice that it didn't open up a separate module, a separate Esri module. It just kept me here in my own module, which is what I want. And uh, so I'll hit step over again. Setting the workspace also takes a few seconds, but eventually it will finish and move on to the next line. And I can continue hitting step. And notice down in the interactive window, it printed uh, zero because uh, of this loop. I'm saying that I wanted to um, loop going from zero to 99 using that range method there. I didn't mean to hit that one. And I can continue like that. Again, as I said, I like to use F10 instead of clicking on the button. So now I'm just clicking. Okay, so uh, this would continue. Uh, all the way down to 99. And let's say I want to check out what's happening down here. As I mentioned, I can add a breakpoint. So to do that, I just place the cursor on whatever line uh, I want to have the breakpoint on. And click on this little hand icon. As it says there, that toggles a breakpoint. So when a breakpoint is on, I'll see a little To remove that, I would just hit the button again. Okay, so uh, if I want to go from some place above the breakpoint and then you know execute down to it, 
I would click on the Go button here. And you'll see that it did the rest of the, the loop, hitting the print statement on each pass through the loop. And then at this point, I could uh, use F10 which um, you know, takes me through this list feature classes line, generating a list of the feature classes in this workspace. And then I've got a loop that, that goes through uh, the items in that feature class list. Now, one of the things that I wanted to show you as well was uh, the watch variable box. And so I just turned that on. If it's not on for you, you can click on the, the eyeglasses icon. I've got some uh, things in there already that I'm going to take away because you won't have anything in there. If you want to add something to the watch window, uh, you can just double click on new item, type in the variable, I in there, and it tells me that the value or the value of I right now is 99. That makes sense because we just went through the loop and the last Add was 99. I could also plug in um, FC and it tells me that FC is city boundaries .shp. That's the first shape file found in that workspace. Now you'll notice that it it's actually prefixed with this little lowercase u uh, which indicates that the that that string is actually in Unicode uh, format. And I don't want to get too deep into the weeds here. Um, basically, Esri uses Unicode to uh, allow for characters in languages other than English. So it, it, it's used to support all of the world's languages. Um, again, I don't want to go too deeply into that. So um, as I continue hitting F10, I went to the top of the loop here. If I hit F10 one more time, I should notice that the FC up in the watch uh, box changes, and it does, it changes the county lines. Okay, so using the watch window uh, can be an effective way to you know, follow how your, your code is working, make sure that variables have the values that you expect them to have. Um, now I could also, uh, one of the things I'm doing in this uh, little example script is I'm using the describe method. I'm describing each feature class on each pass through loop um, and saving that describe object in a variable called DESC. So if I try plugging DESC in there, the value that it shows me is it, it tells me it's a geoprocessing describe data object and gives me the, spa the uh, space of memory where it's held, which isn't particularly useful, right? Um, so one of the things you can do with this is, as the column header says, you're not limited to just plugging in variables. You can also plug in expressions. And so I can do DESC dot shape type. That's one of the properties that you can get And um, that property, that expression, returns to me a value of volume. And again, I can continue hitting F10. When I get to a new feature class, I see, uh, again, FC changes in value. If I change, uh, if I go through the describe line, I'll see that DESC.shape type now changes from polygon to polyline because the fairies feature class is a polyline feature class. Okay, so um, you know, that's uh, hopefully a helpful demo through using the the uh, debugging tools. Close out of get out of debugging mode here, and let me just open up the. Uh, I've got an infinite loop. This is the same code we saw earlier. 
So I just wanted to show you um, how you can try to get out of a loop uh, like this. So I'll hit go and I should have made sure the interactive window was showing. It would show you that it's you know, spinning out years um, unendingly. <laughs> and what I can do is I can go down to the, the system tray, I guess this is called. You should see a Python win icon. I can right click on that and I can try this break into running code. That's meant to allow you to stop an infinite loop like this, but I've found that it doesn't really work. <laughs> um, sometimes I've seen where there's a little Python icon down here that I can try hitting that break into running code and it works. Um, can't find anything on that that menu. So if that doesn't work for you, you're really left with just closing Python win altogether, unfortunately. Okay, so um, that's what I wanted to go over with you. Uh, at this point, I'll just open it up for questions. Does anybody have any questions about any of the material in lesson two or the assignment at the end of lesson two? Okay, well, yeah, thanks, Jill. And uh, hopefully you folks found this helpful. I'll uh, re post the recording uh, on the, as an announcement, and uh, you can go through it again if you, if you'd like to. All right, thanks everybody for attending, and uh, we'll see you again uh, down the road.